I am able to stand here today confident in who I am as a man. I can say that I'm a male image bearer of the holy God, marred by sin, yes, but redeemed by Christ. And I can say that I can say that because the cultural confusion and the misguided compassion of some of my peers was confronted with the truth by someone who shared it with me in love. I'm glad that you all are here today, not just the youth pastors who will be the first person young people tell, but all pastors and ministers, because you will learn some of the tools and the words that you have available, a deeper understanding of the gospel to tell that truth to others like me who were wavering in our identity. And now it's my distinct honor to welcome that person who shared, shared the truth with me. Rosaria Butterfield, it was a tenured professor of gender studies at Syracuse University, or New York University at Syracuse, but that was before her train wreck of a conversion that cost her so much, but brought so much more. She is now an author and a speaker. Her latest book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, talks about practicing radically ordinary hospitality in our post-Christian world, and I encourage you to purchase it today. She is the wife of Kent Butterfield, the mother of four by adoption, and the mother to numerous more spiritually. Please join me in welcoming my dear mother in Christ, Rosaria Butterfield. Sean's talking about calling strangers. You're not a stranger. You were just a friend I hadn't met yet. <laughs> How do I tell you about my conversion to Christ without making it sound like an alien abduction or a train wreck? You see, the truth be told, it felt a little bit like both. I spent one decade of my life in serially monogamous lesbian relationships, and I spent two decades of my life working to advance LGBTQ rights. The world we live in now, with constitutional rights to gay marriage and abortion, with unbiblical views of personhood rooted in sexual desire and not image of God, and with demands for change based on feelings and not facts, well, that's the world that I helped make. I am the face of the problem. The blood is on my hands. Well, I should say up front that I've never hated men, and in my 20s, I even dated men. And while I was publicly dating men, I was privately falling in love with women. And at 28, I met my first lesbian lover, and truly, life just came together for me and made sense. My life as a lesbian seemed normal. I considered it an enlightened, chosen path. Lesbianism felt cleaner and more moral to me. Always preferring symmetry to asymmetry, I felt I had found my real self. And the name Jesus which had rolled off my tongue in a little girl's prayer and then rolled off my back in college, now made me recoil with anger. As a professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University, I tired of students who believed that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. In fact, Christians seemed like bad readers to me, and I thought that was ironic given that Christians believed that the Bible was the true truth. You see, Christians use the Bible in a way that Marxists call vulgar, to end a conversation rather than to deepen it. But the most frustrating thing to me about Christians is that they simply would not leave consenting adults alone. I just thought that was, you know, 
good manners. That was the golden rule. You see, I cared about morality and justice and compassion. I was a 19th century scholar, and I was fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin. I strove to stand with the disempowered, and my life at this time was happy and meaningful and full. My partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, our Golden Retriever Rescue, and our, uni our Unitarian Universalist Church, just to name a few. It was hard to argue that she and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. Indeed, the LGBTQ community values hospitality, and it applies it with skill and sacrifice and integrity. And I honed the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my queer community. Well, after my tenure book was written, I began writing my next one on something that really mattered to me, on the religious right and on their politics of hatred against people like me. You see, I considered you all, evangelical pastors, to be chief hate mongers that comprise this assault against me. You people simply terrified me. And 20 years ago, I faced my fear of you by trying to write a book against you, a book explaining why the Bible and its applications were irrelevant in a secular world. And to write this book, I began reading the Bible. And you know, I had never really gotten around to doing that. <laughs> I read most other books, but not this one. And I, I was really taken by it. I was, I, was, I was really smitten by the fact that this Bible was this engaging literary display of literally every genre and trope and type. I mean, it had edgy poetry and complex philosophy and compelling narrative stories, but it also embodied a worldview that I hated. Sin, repentance, Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I thought that was totally absurd. Well, at this time, the Christian men's movement, the Promise Keepers, came to town, and they parked their little circus at the university. <laughs> And I don't know what they did to me. I don't know if my favorite parking spot was taken. But I was, remember, on a war against patriarchy. So I wrote an article, and I published it in the Syracuse Post Standard. They gave me a full page on the op-ed section, and they titled it, The Promise Keeper's Message is a Danger to Democracy. This was 1997. Well, this article generated so many rejoinders that I kept boxes on each side of my desk. This is back in the day when people wrote you letters. Uh, and I had a box for hate mail, and I had a box for fan mail. And I sort, of, I sort of considered both to be of equal annoyance, to tell you the truth. And then there is this one letter that came to me from a pastor, like you all. And his name is Ken Smith. Um, He's still alive, he's in his 90s now, and, and still speaking and still, and still ministering, but he wrote me this letter. And it was the most disarming letter I have ever received in my entire life. It was simply the kindest letter of opposition. And I was disarmed by it, and I was puzzled by it. You see, so the first thing I do with an article, a letter like that, is I've got to get it out of my desk because it's too disarming. So I threw it away. And then at the end of the day, I found myself somewhat unglamorously bending over the university's enormous recycling bin, trying to fish it out. And I found it. But you see, the reason that this article, that this letter was so disarming was that I was suspicious of both the motives and the worldview that Christians espoused. I had already seen plenty of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches, and that Christians who protested against me and mocked me at gay pride day were happy that I and everyone else was going to hell was simply as clear as the sky is blue. But Ken's letter did not mock. It engaged. And from his letter, Ken seemed different. And so when he invited me to dinner at his house, to discuss these matters more fully, 
I accepted. I accepted for two reasons. One, the gay community is also given to hospitality. So the idea that you would go to somebody's home to actually talk about hard things was already part of my culture. But the other is that I was a user, and I thought of Ken Smith as my unpaid research assistant for this new book. I thought, well, here's somebody who actually knows the Bible and understands it, and I can maybe learn something from him. Well, something else happened. Ken and his wife, Floy, and I became friends. They entered my world, and they met my friends, and we did book exchanges. I, I, I ate with them once a week, mostly at their home, but sometimes at mine. And we talked openly about sexuality and politics, and they did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They also did not treat me like a blank slate, like, like someone who just needed to um, come to Jesus and everything would be fine. Not at all. And when we, we ate together, Ken prayed in a way that I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate and vulnerable. He actually repented of his sin in front of me. Ken thanked God for all things. And I, I took note of who this God was in Ken Smith's life. Well, his God was holy and firm and yet full of mercy. And after my first meal in their home, I'll tell you why there were hundreds of meals, because of what happened at the first meal. At the first meal, it, it was a lovely time, and it's time to go, and we're about to say goodbye, and I'm getting ready for the sucker punch, because you know what the sucker punch, the sucker punch is, you're going to hell, you need to commit your life to Jesus, or at least come to church this Sunday. You know, something, anything. But that's not what Ken Smith did. He actually trusted that I was going to get back in my little red truck with all my gay rights stickers on it and drive two miles to my home and, 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 and not get hit by a meteor or a truck or a train. You know, he actually trusted that we were going to get together again next week. So you know what he said? He said, it was a pleasure meeting you. Good night. He did not share the gospel with me and he did not invite me to church which made me think two things. One, I clearly am chop liver, right? I don't even rank. I mean, I know the playbook as well as you people do. I was writing a book on it. Um, but number two, it made me feel safe to go back the next week. You see, I was not Ken Smith's project. I was his neighbor. And that mattered. And so I started meeting with Ken and Floyd regularly, reading this Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook in lap. And I read the Bible the way I was trained to read a book. I'm, I'm, I have a PhD in English literature. I've never been raised in the evangelical church. I did not know you're supposed to read the Bible one verse at a time out of order. Okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, go, go try to read Jane Eyre like that and come and tell me you don't understand it. So I just sat down and I read the book. And I found that, you know, and a lot happens. I, I recommend this to people all the time. Sit down and read the book of Genesis tonight. Amen. You know what will happen? There will not be some mystery at the idea that, that sin slowly crept into the world. That happens because you suck on every line like it's a butterscotch and you don't, you don't read the next one until the butterscotch is done. If you read this whole book, just sitting down in one fell swoop, which is how I read it, life is a bloodbath as soon as Adam eats the apple or the fruit or whatever it was. It is the consequence of original sin is immediate. And so I'm trained to read a book. I, I'm trained to discuss and understand how books fit together. And this book is blowing me away. And none of my arguments against it are holding up. And I had to at least ponder this hermeneutical claim that this book really was different from all the others because it read like something different from all the others. And it was holding together like something different from all the others. And the only argument that I had was this evangelical argument that I hated, and that's that this book is different from all the others because it's inspired by a holy God and it's inherently true and trustworthy. And I just wondered, how in the world is that ever going to work for me? I, I rejected what I believed was the false simplicity of Christian logic. That's its doctrine of sin 
and its belief that the Bible was God-breathed. Well, you see, Christians believed that because Jesus paid with his life for the sin of all those who would repent and believe in him, that we have Christ's power to flee even from unchosen sin, which the Bible records as treason against God and punishable by death and hell. And I noticed that as I read the Bible, its admonitions about sin were actually followed by offers of grace. And that the God of the Bible deals differently with people when people deal differently with him. But how in the world could that system work for me? You know, I didn't actually see how I was hurting anyone. I believed I was living my authentic self and I, you know, I couldn't quite reconcile this with, with this category of sin. I, I recoiled at the idea that being a lesbian was living in sin. I mean, who in her right mind could choose a God you cannot see over a lover you can? Well, it seemed to me, quite frankly, that whatever this research project was going to turn out to be, the gospel was both illogical and very bad news for people like me, people who identified on the LGBTQ spectrum. But if God is the creator of all things, and if the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then it actually did seem logical to me that the Bible had the right to interrogate my life and my culture and not the other way around. You see, even as a postmodern reader, I understood the idea that authority can only depend upon that which is higher than itself. I mean, I was a professor after all, and if your paper was due to me Tuesday at 9 a.m. and you bothered to get it in Wednesday at 5, that would not go well for you. I mean, you may be a very nice person, nicer than I am. You may walk your dog regularly and, and feed your plants and all of that. But the truth is, I just have more authority than you. And it seemed to me if that was true about me and you, that was true about God and me. Who is higher than God? I wondered. Well, my friends knew that I was reading the Bible. And some of my more perceptive friends knew that it was becoming more than just a research project. And at a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, so this is the 90s, this is New York, the AIDS crisis has just, is just driving through my culture, and it was uh, fairly common for someone's home in the gay community to be opened every night of the week. So that literally everybody in the gay community knew where to go if you were struggling. If you were just struggling with a scary diagnosis, or suicide, or depression, or just sadness, or loneliness. And so uh, my partner and I had a certain night of the week, and our home was open, and so this was this dinner gathering. And so at this dinner gathering that my partner and I hosted weekly, my transgendered friend, Jill, cornered me in the kitchen. Jill put her large hand over mine and said, Rosaria, this Bible is changing you, and I don't like it, and I'm scared. Well, I felt exposed because Jill was right. And I know it, I knew it, I just didn't think anyone else had noticed. And so I sat down and I said, okay, Jill, what if it's true? What if there is a real and risen Lord? And what if this Bible actually reveals all of this, the truth about who we all are, every single one of us. What if it's true? Well, you know, if it's true, we're all in trouble. Well, Jill exhaled deeply, and she sat down in the chair across from me, and she looked very sad and very wise and very tired. And Jill said this. Jill said, Rosaria, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. Well, now you know what gay rights activists talk about in the kitchen. I mean that sincerely. I mean that sincerely. This encounter gave me a kind of secret tacit permission to keep reading this Bible and keep digging around because I had to come to this, I had to come to the bottom of this. If it's true, I'm dead. If it's not, I'm free. 
But the other thing that this encounter did was it made me really mad. I was a gay rights activist. I didn't need healing. I believed that gay was good. I believed that the culture needed healing. And furthermore, the Bible I was reading didn't say I needed healing either. It said I needed to repent of my sin. And quite frankly, I didn't want prayers for repentance and I didn't want prayers for healing. And so I was enraged and also on fire to keep reading this Bible. Well, the next day when I returned home from work, I found two large milk crates spilling over with books. These were Jill's books from seminary. And you know how it is, you walk in the door, you put your book bag down, you pick up a new, I mean, there's nothing more exciting than two boxes of new books. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, let the dogs out, you're looking at this book. And I found my friend's handwriting. And you know back in the day of marginalia, before Kindle, you would get a book and a friend, it was almost like a love letter. Like, oh, what does my friend think of this book? And I opened this book called Kelvin's Institutes. And there in the margin is Jill's handwriting. And it says, watch Romans 1. Well, I had read the Bible a few times through, but there are some passages I was skipping. <laughs> and Romans 1 was one of those. But with my friend as a guide, I sat down and I read Romans, Romans 1. And this is what I found. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Well, these verses seem to provide a haunting literary echo to Genesis 3 where Eve's desire to live independently of God's authority made perfect sense to me. And, and the two literary frames, one in Genesis, one in Romans, stood out as the table of contents of what ails the world. Indeed, Romans 1 does not end by highlighting homosexuality as a morally neutral form of sexual orientation, as a discrete and separate category of inherited personhood that many people believe it to be today. No, no, this, this passage goes right to the heart. It, it finds its crescendo in how one sin, homosexuality, morphs into other sins, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same things, but they give hearty approval to those who do practice them. Well, this last line grabbed me by the throat. It told me, that if you're one of those people who can't get a blessing from God, you will demand it from men. As the faculty advisor to many LGBTQ groups on campus, this got my attention. But I also took note of the theological diagnosis. Homosexuality in the Bible is presented here as one step in the journey away from God's blessing and protection. I also took note, though, about what the Bible did not say about homosexuality. The Bible did not recognize homosexuality as a noun, as a category of personhood. 
The world has accepted that the 19th century invention of sexual orientation as an accurate category of personhood and identity is the truest of truths, but that's simply not how the Bible understood homosexuality. I mean, I searched for it. I was a 19th century scholar. I was a gay rights activist. I knew my body, or so I thought, and I knew what was my authentic and true self, or so I thought. And here is this book, and it hangs me off a cliff, and I can't find what I know to be true. And that's when it hit me. Homosexuality, from God's point of view, is totally different than what I have always believed. It's an identity rooted, ethical outworking of original sin. And I stopped for a moment and I almost laughed out loud. You mean I have my homosexuality is Adam's thumbprint on my life? And therefore, it did seem that the Bible had justification to condemn me. But it also seemed that some of us had justification to tell you that when we feel born this way, when people tell you that they felt attracted to women before they knew their name, when you hear stories like this, well, that's true too. Because being born in Adam means that we're all born this way, one way or another. But by failing to rigorously relinquish my identity to God's story and failing to understand that the fall rendered even my deepest, most primal feelings untrustworthy and untrue, I had added to my ledger of original sin by creating for myself a category of personhood that God did not. God has one category of personhood. We are male and female image bearers of a holy God with a soul that will last forever and a gendered body that will inherit either to the new Jerusalem or suffer in hell for eternity. There simply is no biblical category of personhood subsumed under the 19th century category invention of sexual orientation. You have no idea what a strange experience it was for me to be sitting at my desk looking at this for the first time. You know, I'm a 19th century scholar. That's, you know, that's the century that produced all the vampire things. And I, I remember thinking, I'm actually like a vampire. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look in a mirror and nothing's going to come back. I have built this entire house of cards about who I am, and none of it is true. The Bible declares that we are made in the image of God and that we do have a sin orientation in Adam and a soul orientation in eternity and once born again in Christ, a new citizenship, one that came in exchange for the life that you loved, not in addition to it. In spite of believing, living, and teaching the idea that sexuality and gender were social constructs, the Bible made it clear to me that actually God has set ethical, and moral responsibilities, blessings, and restraints for being born male or female, and that I'm accountable to these responsibilities, whether they feel good to me or not. Well, I had taught, studied, read, and lived a very different notion of sexuality, and for the first time in my life, I wondered if I was wrong. And so I did the only logical thing. I quit this stupid research project and I tried to throw the Bible and its teachings in the trash. <laughs> tried to find that old phone number for my, that last therapist that helped me in my last breakup. Have a glass of wine, get on with life. But here was my problem. There is one reason I couldn't do all of those things because that's what bouncing back meant to me. My problem was Ken and Floy Smith. Because you know what they had become? Friends. Friends whom I trusted. And so I told them what was going on. And they told me to keep reading. Now, among other things, I was fighting some intellectual battles too. I was fighting this idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. 
that the biblical authors were moved by the Holy Spirit to record the word of God and that the Bible was completely true and without error. How could a smart cookie like me believe these things? I didn't even believe in truth. I was a postmodernist. I believed in truth claims. I believed that the reader constructed the text, that a text meaning found its interpretation and authority only with a reader pouring into it. I told my students over and over again that without a reader, a book is just paper and glue. Throw it away. How dare this one book lay claim to a birthright and a progeny radically different than every other book on the planet? Well, after years and years of this, and I mean years and years of this, I drove Ken Smith and Floyd Smith and that church community crazy for two years. I hadn't walked through the door of the church yet. I just sat at Ken's table and argued with all the people who walked in for two years, during which time I read through the Bible seven times. And after that, I know that really, isn't it crazy? That gives the Holy Spirit a lot of time in your life. I'm just going to tell you. You read through the Bible seven times in the next two years, you're going to spend a lot of time. <laughs> but after two years, one thing happened. And it was a small thing. But it was a big thing. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world. And I couldn't keep back the floodgates. And then one Sunday morning, two years after I first met Ken and Floyd, two years after the, you know, all the stuff, I left the bed that I shared with my lesbian partner, and an hour later, I sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. Small little church, I sat in the back, and Ken was at the pulpit, and I was glad to see him. He wasn't in a robe. He kind of looked the same that he looked at the dinner table. That made me feel very comfortable. Like, okay, maybe he's the same guy. And he looked up and he said, oh, hi, Rosaria. Oh, don't sit back there. Sit, sit with Floyd. And so if I thought I was going to just be anonymous, you know, forget it. Like, just forget it. But then there I was, just enveloped in the arms of my spiritual mother. There I was with my Doc Martens and my butch haircut and my jeans and all of my symbols of queer paraphernalia. And there was this sweet pastor's wife just sitting next to me with her arm around me as if that was just normal. They just do that all the time. Well, I sat there and I felt like a traitor because I kept thinking about last year's Gay Pride March, wide as it was with people just like me, people who made me feel safe and loved, people I valued as family. And as Ken was preaching on the narrow gate and the wide gate, I knew that when I th crossed that threshold into the life of the church, that I had just betrayed everyone I loved most in the world. But Ken and Floyd still wouldn't let go of me. They'd still check in with me throughout the week. And I kept coming back to church to hear more sermons. I had actually made friendships with people in the church at this time. And I was totally perplexed. Some of them are at the university. I was completely perplexed by how they referenced the Bible in the details of their day. Well, first of all, they used direct quotations. And if you know anything about English professors, you should know this. We love direct quotations. There's just not enough direct quotations in the day. I sometimes have to go and just write quotations down at the end of the day just to put things in my book just so that I have them. And so there is something really compelling about these Christians who could just quote, you know, at length from the Bible. But there is also something completely terrifying by, about this. I mean, at this point, I knew enough about the Bible to know that it had its own ontology, as Dr. Anderson uh, introduced this morning. It had it, its own life, its own way of being. And I thought this was crazy. I mean, cross-referencing the Bible with your life, it actually puts you inside God's story. It puts you in God's ontology. And I thought, is this safe? I mean, I'm certainly not going to try this. I know it'd be dangerous for me. You know, don't try this at home. How are these people doing this? But I was noticing something else about my Christian friends and the way they're handling the text of the Bible. 
They were simply getting things out of the Bible that I wasn't. They were understanding how the Bible fit together as a whole. And because of that, they seemed to be fueled by a kind of dynamism that I knew I simply did not possess. Why couldn't I see what they did? I wondered. Well, at this point, Ken was preaching through the Gospel of Matthew with its bewildering set of characters and problems. From a literary point of view, Matthew is fascinating. These unsuspecting goat, uh, folks separated under the Gospel, seeds choked by the world. I mean, wild metaphors. You, you know, you'd get an F in your creative writing class if you use them. And then, and then here's my favorite, feeding thousands with some poor and nameless kids bread and fish. Who is that kid? Why didn't he get a name? I wanted him to have a name. And then, and then Jesus is cutting question to impetuous Peter. Do you still lack understanding? Well, one Lord's Day, Pastor Ken Smith just stopped right there, turned his steel blue eyes on us, repeated that question, do you still lack understanding? And then stood there frozen for the longest time. And I thought, oh no, the guy's having a heart attack. And the frozen chosen are just going to sit here. <laughs> I really did. But then he finally, he finally started talking again. And he said, people of God, that question is for you. Do you still lack understanding? And this really startled me. I mean, this was my question. I just asked myself this question. The question was for me. Why couldn't I see what they did? Do I still lack understanding? And for a split second before I could shove this feeling back down into the recesses of my conscience, I had this one flashing question. Who just was speaking there? That old man I thought was having a heart attack? Or the God man behind the foundations of the world and the redemption of his people? And the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell vomited into my conscience and gripped me in its teeth. Not only because we called ourselves gay, but because we were proud. We wanted to be autonomous. We rejected the Bible's interpretive authority over our sexuality, our sexual identity, and our sexual practice. And sitting in church that moment, it struck me that if the Bible is true, I was dead. And if the Bible is false or semi-true or only true in parts that correspond to my worldview or only true on Tuesdays at 12 or whatever other neo-orthodox shift you want to put to it, then you are simply looking at the biggest fool on earth. But God's promises started to roll in like another round of waves into my world. And the next Lord's Day, Ken was preaching on John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. Ken explained that this verse reordered something that he felt we needed to know about. Well, this verse truly exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. You see, I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them and tell everybody else what to think about them. I, I was paid to do this, and I expected that in all areas of my life, understanding came before obedience and not the other way around. And it, it occurred to me that I wanted God to show me on my terms why my homosexuality was a sin. You see, I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. I mean, perhaps I thought, thought like Eve in the garden, I just wanted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that I could become and replace God. And then I wondered, well, hadn't I already eaten of that tree? I mean, hadn't we all? If my consciousness fell in Adam's sin, as the Bible purports, no wonder I couldn't think my way out of this quandary. This wasn't a game of thinking and of matching of wits. I love those games. Sign me up. This was not those games. This was this, this, the playbook for this game was different. It asked me this question. Could my heart echo God's call for obedience? Could I will 
to do God's will just this once. The stakes were so very high because they always are. But this verse promised understanding after obedience. And I wrestled with this question. Did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view? Or did I just want to argue with him? So I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed that God would be pleased to reveal his son in me. I prayed that I would be a vessel of Jesus. And then I moved to gender, and I don't know why, but I started to have this growing desire to make biblical sense of my place in the world as a woman defined by and covered by God. And so I prayed that God would make me a godly woman. And then I laughed out loud in defiance at my unbelief at the total insanity of that kind of prayer. So truly, I left that night of prayer in somewhat of a bust, but I left pondering this one question. Could original sin be for real? And if so, could it really distort me like this? I mean, is my sexual love for women a reflection of the real me? or a distortion of it through original sin? Is being a lesbian my authentic self, or is it Adam's thumbprint on my life? Who am I, I wondered. You know, philosophers sometimes distinguish between the real, which is the lived, and the material, and the true, the deeper realities of ontology, of past purpose, and future beholding. And I, I wondered, I wondered if being a lesbian was real, if it was perhaps not true. I mean, if Jesus could split the world asunder, defy the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? I mean, who will God have me to be? I still felt like a lesbian in my body and a heart. That was, I, I felt my flesh's identity. But what is a Christian identity? Well, the, the Bible makes clear that fallen flesh and redeemed mind have a very troubled relationship this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their redeemed identity and calling comes after only long struggles with God, with wilderness, with dreams and hopes and plans dashed and destroyed. What will become of me if Jesus takes over, I wondered. The cross is ruthless. It makes no ally with the sin it crushes in the death and resurrection of the Lord. But what if I commit my life to Christ and my lesbian feelings never disappear? Does that mean God does not love me or hear me or care? Is the gospel really good news for me? Or is it bad news for people who identify on the LGBTQ continuum? Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then one ordinary day, there is no place else to go. And so I came to Jesus. I was in church and we were singing from Psalm 119. And when the line, this has become mine, came out of my mouth, I gasped in horror. You see, I had just sung condemnation unto myself, and I was in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to feel his convicting rebuke. This Bible was not mine. Oh, I had read it many times over, absolutely. I could even quote from it at this point. But I had scorned it and cursed it and despised it, and I had taught thousands of college students to do the same. But sitting there in church singing, this is mine, I realized that it truly did have a holy author. And that's when I saw for myself that it was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation. And when I sang those words, I heard for myself that when the phrase, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was attesting to this one simple truth, that the line of communication that God determined for his people required the wrestling with scripture that I had done and that I truly wanted to both hear God's voice breathed into my life, and I wanted God to hear my pleas. The fog burned away. The whole Bible, each jot and each tittle, 
was my open highway to a holy God. My hands let go of the wheel of self-invention. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed, and naked. I had no dignity upon which to stand. As an advocate for peace and social justice, I thought I was on the side of kindness, integrity, diversity, and care. And it was thus a crushing revelation to discover it. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. And not just some historical figure named Jesus, not some nice guy, but my Jesus, my prophet, my priest, my king, my savior, my redeemer, my husband, my friend, that Jesus. Of course, there's only one thing to do when you meet a living God. You must fall on your face and repent of your sins, including the unchosen ones. I started by repenting of my pride, the pride that had led me to believe that I could invent my own rules for faith and life and sexual autonomy, the pride that said that I was entitled to live separately from God, the pride that led me to believe that self-worth was self-invented. Repentance is the daily posture of the Christian, and it is the threshold to our holy God. Repentance is the only no-shame solution to a renewed Christian life because it proves only the obvious that God was right all along. Well, conversion did not automatically change my sexual desires for women. You see, I was actually not converted out of homosexuality. I was converted out of unbelief. The gospel comes in exchange for the life you love, not in addition to it. And gospel life is cross-bearing life, and sin, even unchosen sin, produces crosses to bear. In this way, same-sex attraction for many believers is Adam's thumbprint. And if you are listening today and you are experiencing unchosen same-sex attraction, and you are battling sin in God's way, What's God's way? Well, you're forsaking the false identity of LGBTQ for the true identity of image bearer of a holy God. Forsaking through grace any sexual identity or sexual practice that God calls sin. Embracing chastity and singleness and fidelity in marriage and what my friend and author Christopher Yuan calls holy sexuality. Then you, agonizing struggle and all, well, you're what we call a hero of the faith. And as you stand in the risen Christ alone in this battle, you should not be shunned or despised or demeaned, but rather embraced as a brother and sister in Christ, standing as a decorated soldier in robes of righteousness, hearing your father's words, beloved son, beloved daughter, in you I am well pleased. Well, for me, something in addition happened after I crossed the threshold into faith in Christ. My prayer to be a godly woman morphed into another prayer, to be a godly wife. We must pause here and remember that while biblical marriage is a wonderful gift from God, it is not a gospel requirement. I believe that there is a vital and powerful role for singles in the church and that singleness in Christ is neither selfishness nor secondhand gospel citizenship. Singles in your church, people, do not need to be fixed or fixed up. But nonetheless... I felt called, if God willed, to ask God to make me a godly wife, to work in me such that I could be a helper in all aspects to a godly man. And a year later, I met my husband, Kent Butterfield. And he's here today, so you'll get a chance to meet him later on our panel. We have been joyfully married for 17 years, walking the Lord together. And my role as Kent's helper and the mother of our children It's my daily witness that we serve a God who lives, hears our prayers, loves his people, liberates captives, and equips us to live fully in Christ as the strongholds of sin are broken down through the grace of Christ's blood. So the gospel is costly, and the gospel is always worth it. The crosses that the Lord meets out, though, are are not democratic. Some people get ten crosses, and others get one. And you know, people in your church who are struggling against same-sex attraction, they're in the 10 cross category right now. They're feeling pulled apart by wild horses between a church that says, I don't know what to do. I'm sorry, brother, that's gotta be tough. And between the world that says, we know what to do, join us, the party just started. It's imperative that we remember the vitality, the importance of friendship 
mean, I wouldn't be standing here today if Ken and Floyd Smith hadn't served me hundreds of meals, hundreds of them. So it's important to remember that the little things count. And while a number of things about my story are different, I mean, 20 years ago seems like, the, you know, they were talking about the ancient ruins when it comes to where the sexual revolution has taken us. And on our panel later today, we'll, we'll talk more about some of those pressure points. But for now, people of God, pastors, have hope. I'm standing here because somebody like you invited me to dinner and was willing to stand beside me when things got hard didn't see me as a blank slate, saw me as an image bearer of a holy God and held God's mirror out to me consistently, put up with it when I said stupid things, not only to you, but about you publicly and prayed. So don't lose heart. The keys of the kingdom aren't lost. And I think revival is just around the corner because you know what? Our churches need to be ready for what will happen when people like me are betrayed by the gay rights movement. Are you ready for the refugees? Because they're coming. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us on Facebook Live at the Pastor Summit, Ministry in an Age of Gender Confusion. We just heard from Rosaria Butterfield, my dear friend. And we thank you so much for sharing your testimony uh, today with us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Did you get to say everything you wanted to say? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. But that's, that's what old English professors struggle with, right? right? We just I like long books, and my manuscripts are too long, too. But I was, I'm, it's been so exciting to be here and to talk with the pastors who are on the front line of this conversation. I'm really grateful that you all put this together. Thank you. Yeah, there are 400 pastors here in person and others watching online, but you talked about manuscripts right now and you had written a book recently that just came out. Yes. The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Practicing ordinary hospita Radically Ordinary <laughs> Hospitality in a Post-Christian World. Tell us more about that book. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times people want to know how people like me come to faith. And of yeah. course, I was a gay rights activist. I was happy in my lesbian relationship. All was well. And then there was this neighbor, mm -hmm. this neighbor who's a pastor who had me in his home week after week after week. And in so many ways, the hospitality backstory of the way Jesus worked through Ken Smith is too important to not talk about. And so often people will say, how did, how did you come to Christ? And I share what kind of hospitality I received. And often these people walk away rich young ruler style. And so, uh, you know, when, when you know, because we're friends and we're in this together and we sometimes do this hospitality together, that, that Kent and I, for 17 years of marriage, have been practicing the very same kind of hospitality that the Lord used in my conversion because we know what it's like to be lonely. And I think what, what, what we need to understand is that if you're going to minister in a post-Christian world, you need to answer the good things that this world is saying. This world is pointing out some real problems. People are dying of crushing loneliness. It is not a small thing. And a church service from 10 to 12 is not the answer. The people of God need to live like the family of God. And in that way, people like me then have a, they can vision, they can, they can visualize what life might look like. Right. And, and it's, it's too powerful to miss. You cannot, in a post-Christian world, live in a selfish way. And that's a hard message. And a yeah. lot of people walk away when they hear the cost. How can someone practice radically ordinary hospitality when their house is a mess, their yeah. kids are out of control, and right. letting someone into that craziness would be very costly. How right. do you answer that? Right, right. Well, except for that you have stepped right into that. In fact, I recall it was just two <laughs> weeks ago that you showed up on a Friday night and I think my children were jumping on your car. That's right. Isn't yes. that correct? And, and all of the neighbor children as well. <laughs> yes. They were there. They were there. Right. Okay. So I don't know. You should tell us. I, I would say this. I mean, obviously you want to have your house in order, in God's order, but you know, messy isn't sinful. 
I personally don't think people are going to die, uh, you know, from, you know, dog hair on my couch, but people will die of crushing loneliness. Wow. So, so, you know, part of what we do in the book, the book is, is a memoir, like all the other books in some ways. It's my, it's the voice on the page that I, that I, that I like to write in. So I do let my readers into how that works. But, you know, Jesus specializes in mess. So let's not be proud about, you know, a clean house. And that book is The Gospel Comes with a House Key. So order it today. And for those of uh, the pastors here, they have a chance to order it outside. But what happens for someone who, like me, is single and whether they're struggling with same-sex yeah. attraction or not. How, what, what role do singles in the church play with hospitality? Right. I don't have a home of my own. Right. I live in the basement apartment of a family. So right, right. how a do I huge, help welcome people in? You have a huge part because this isn't individual, this isn't um, separate little islands of families doing this. This is the church coming together. So let me remind you what your role was last Easter when we had 40 people over. And uh, I don't know how many potatoes you peeled while I was, I think, writing a, a blog piece. But as I recall, if you weren't there peeling potatoes, I wouldn't have gotten you know, something else done. So you know what that means. It means that we, we pile in together and that singles in the church are the, my children's aunts and uncles and mm -hmm. my brothers and sisters. And we are part of the covenant of church membership. It means something. I mean, what would happen if your neighbors could just look across the street and say, I don't know what it is about that house, but being a member of a church means something. Mm -hmm. It means that they're never mm -hmm. alone. It means that they're not lonely. It means that they're they quickly can resolve problems among each other and for our neighborhood. It would mean an enormous thing. And you know people do that. They look in the winter in your Syracuse and you see a snowblower and you covet it because you know what? That works. We want people to covet <laughs> the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in our communities. I heard you just say we want people to break one of the commandments. <laughs> Oh, you're so picky. <laughs> oh, I am an attorney, lesser known fact. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your speaking to us today. Thank the you last for thing you said, you're, you're, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. That's what Christian brothers do. Absolutely. So the last thing you said on stage was talking about the hope of revival. Could yes. you just talk about that Absolutely. a little bit more and what the church can do to welcome refugees, yes. to be prepared for that? Absolutely. You know, right now you need to understand that the, the message of the gay rights movement is a politi political coalition of rights earned and garnered and kept because they you cannot receive a blessing right. from God when you are sinning against God. Right. And it's a painful thing. I remember being there. You're desperate. You're like a right. drowning person needing air. So the desire that the gay rights uh, community has for political rights is something I completely identify with. Right. But here's the deal, people. The gay rights movement is playing you mm. and Jesus never will. And so the church needs to be ready to make good on that wow. truth.